the sea preserves remains better than land. And you've got in the book the, the very potent image of the drowned city. What what goes on when a city is sort of pulled or is subsumed by, by the sea? Yes, it's, it's a story of two sides of a city, really. You, you have the, the, the surface side and the, the underground side. For any city, you know, for instance, New Orleans or, or, uh, or Venice, you know, these are all both prime candidates for fossilization. The surface parts almost certainly uh, will be knocked about more than somewhat. The upper stories will collapse. The waves will, will wash them and sort them and segregate them, convert them into sand and, and boulders. But what is underground? The cellars, if we're very lucky, may be part of the, 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 the lower ground floors. All of the, the networks of, of pipes and tunnels and sewers and such like, that has a fighting chance of being preserved more or less intact. The kind of things that will happen to that is, is if you have a city that is drowned and that is actively subsiding on a piece of crust that is taking what I call a downwards tectonic escalator. That city, the remains of it, will be buried by more sediment and that sediment will pile up meter after meter and then kilometer after kilometer and so the remains will be crushed, compacted, heated up, uh, they may be torn apart by earthquakes, they may be tipped upside down by mountain building movements of the future. But nonetheless, that is exactly what happens to fossils of the past. And we have now little problem in reading these fragments of preserved histories. I suppose the shock comes, though, in thinking that our remains will be the subject of study for geologists rather than archaeologists. Because we, we, used, <laughs> we used to our material culture being kind of poured over by archaeologists, but what you're saying is you go far enough into the future and actually we are geological data rather than archaeological data. We will then be the, the alien species, uh, as alien as, let's say, uh, you know, a dinosaur or, or a, a sea urchin uh, or a, a lobster or a trilobite is, is to us. The only thing that will link us with the, the observers to be will be the level of organization and intelligence. Uh, so there'll be much curiosity, I'd imagine, there. But it will be very difficult, I think, for the, the observers of the future to get inside the mind of, of us as human beings. Our effects, our effects particularly on the planet, on the environment, will be much clearer uh, than anything that we might consider to be the human part of our natures. So love and hate and music and sport and frivolity, all of that will be terribly hard, if not impossible to read. It's even hard for us to read the motives of previous humans. If you look at Stonehenge, for instance, we have no idea whether Stonehenge was a, a ceremonial object, uh, whether it was for commerce, whether it was a, a meeting place, whether it was to do with astronomy, or it might have been very different, differently used at different times. And that wasn't long ago, and it was our species, and yet we still struggle greatly. So imagine just how difficult it will be to have smaller fragments and Stonehenge left for a completely alien intelligence to, to try and grapple with. And the, the principal thing that they will find in this sort of human balance sheet will be the step change in global temperature that will that will be the will that be the first thing they notice that there was a a rapid in geological terms warming of the earth's temperature and it was from an anthropogenic causes yes the, the warming they will see the the anthropogenic cause they will eventually discover i think but the warming will almost certainly cause the ice sheets to melt that will give rise to a, a rapid rise in sea level there have been examples of that in the past uh, frequently. It does leave a strong geological signal. You know, for instance, you can replace one sort of, of rock, uh, a sandstone of a beach, by another sort, uh, a deep sea mud, for instance. And, and that is uh, clear. An undergraduate student can easily see that. The mass extinction also will leave a, a significant signal. That is only just beginning, but give us another century and we will be competing pretty well with the, the mass extinctions of the past. The one strange thing about this will be that, as well as species becoming extinct, they will also be becoming more impoverished, 
as we've converted vegetation on the planet to a very few species to feed ourselves. And also you'll have these strange migrations of rats and pigs and goats going everywhere. That will be geologically unique and that again will lead them to be thinking that something strange has been going on even before they find the first fragment of a human city. Yes, you have interesting things to say about pollen, for example, as, as we go to more and more monocultures and species loss in the plant kingdom speeds up. That, 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 that will leave a record of the pollen types reducing in, in number. That's right. Yes, one of the, the, the best records uh, we have of, of the plants of the past uh, is in the fossil pollen they leave. The pollen is, is robust, it's very abundant in, in, in sedimentary rocks, it can be extracted. Presumably our future visitors will do the same as well. And there will be this sudden impoverishment and the appearance of new sorts uh, of pollen from the, the, the plants that we have specially bred in order to feed us. That will be quite distinctive and quite new. It seemed to me that your book was geology with a moral purpose. Is that a reasonable characterization of it? I guess so. In common with many other geologists, and one of my colleagues, who tend to be fairly sanguine about various environmental threats of the past, you know, uh, acid rain and pollution and things like that, you know, have been just par for the course. But the kind of things we're doing now are deeply disturbing because they're happening very quickly. They seem at the moment to be almost unstoppable. So this is a, a world which geologically appears out of control. And one way of trying to get across the scale of what is happening is simply to put human activity, current human activity, into the kind of geological context, the context of, of present history within deep history. Because that, to me, shows both the scale and the rapidity of the event. This change that we're causing geologically will look like a meteorite impact strike. It will appear as suddenly in the geological record because most of the change is happening in a few centuries. And a few centuries are, are, you know, I can't tell units of thousands of years apart in the geological record, you know, with any ease at all. So it will appear uh, instantaneous. Presumably, though, you wouldn't want readers of the book to feel entirely overwhelmed and powerless. Presumably, there's a part of the purpose is to is to say, look, this is this is serious, we're we capable of, of immense damage. And therefore, we must we must really not delay and not spend decades discussing what we're doing, but but actually take action. Quite yes, but it is again one of the uh, the tragedies, if you like, is that it, it it is a soluble problem, and it is a question of resources. At the moment, it is still regarded as a problem for the future. It's talked about quite a lot, and there is, there are some resources going in, but those aren't commensurate with the scale of of what's happening. We really only have a few decades left. And if one was to put resources, let's say, into finding new energy sources that are on the scale of, let's say, the recent bank rescue, or let's say, of the Iraq war, then one could make serious progress. And I think one could also then give hope that this is a soluble problem. This can be done. There will be damage, but we can pull through as a civilization. But it, it, it will need time and effort very quickly.